Was there a rich dad or is it pure fiction? You know, so many people have come out to me and say, well, you know, somebody said there really wasn't a rich dad. You know, it's on the web and all this. And I go, well, how in the world would they know? You know what I mean? I said, well, I, I read it on the web. And I'm like, well, how would you know? But today's show is a great show because you'll actually be into, we'll be actually be talking to Rich Dad's son. Any comments there, Kim? Well, uh, this is so exciting. We, okay, so we've never, ever done this. Um, Rich Dad's son has never done an interview with us or with you, Robert, ever since uh, launching the book. So this is a first. This is a real first. And stay tuned because he, he, what, what you're going to hear are a lot of great stories about entrepreneurship. So if you have a business, thinking about a business, if you really want to know what it takes, you're going to hear some fantastic stories. And then you'll, you'll hear from two, you know, road and merit scholars. <laughs> 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 so we were surfing and all this, and we were kind of oddballs. But we had a great time surfing and... Uh, we both flunked out, and, uh, and that was tough because my old man was a head of education, and here I am surfing and flunking out and having a great time. Yet if it wasn't for my rich dad, you know, I don't know where I'd be today because he taught his son and me to be entrepreneurs. And so today's program is, was there really a rich dad? Because we know was... there's a poor dad. Yeah, <laughs> we, we know, know there's a poor, a poor dad. dad. Your dad was the poor dad. My, Worked my... his butt off and ended up with nothing. Broke. And my poor dad was, you know, a PhD, head of education, went to Stanford, University of Chicago, Northwestern, University of Hawaii, but he knew nothing about money. And so most of the time, we were just surfing, having a great time. So that's what this program is about, is the lessons learned and some of the stories from Rich Dad, who was a hardcore entrepreneur. Now, we can't tell all the stories because this is not – this is kind of a family show. But anyway, <laughs> we'll do our there's best. Some, there's some good stories. <laughs> so before we introduce Rich Dad's son, we're going to explain why we've never disclosed. It's, we're coming on the 20-year anniversary of Rich Dad Porta. It came out, in, came out in 1997, April 1st. But we had to be private about it. And it was really tough because when Oprah called in the year 2000, she says, you're not going on the program unless you can prove there's a rich dad. So take it from there, Kim, because you have to prove it, right? Yeah, because and, and you made the agreement with Rich Dad's family, Robert, that when you came out with the book, they said, yes, you can write about it, but keep us anonymous because they're a very, very private family. So when Oprah producer called and said we want Robert on the show we were all excited this was the dream of my life I you know I had all the affirmations and post-its around want to be on Oprah and she gets me on the on the phone and she says you must tell me who Rich Dad is and I said well Robert's out in the boondocks of Australia chasing Skippy the kangaroo and we have an agreement and I cannot do that and she kept at me, and she was screaming at me over the phone, you must tell me who Rich Dad is or Robert's not going on the show. And I'm like, oh, my God. And so I, I, I said, I can't believe I'm going to say this to you. I cannot believe it. But if that's what it's going to take, we have an agreement with the family. I cannot disclose. And if that's what it's going to take, Robert's not going to do the show. And I hung up the phone, and I was, like, petrified. And thank God, two minutes later, she calls back, and she goes, okay, how are we going to make this work? And so what I did is I called Rich Dad's son. And I said, you do not have to do this. This is not a, you don't have to do this. If you want to, great, but it's, we're not required to do it. Um, if you want to give her a call and explain about Rich Dad, great. If not, no problem. And he was gracious enough, made the call to the producer. The producer was happy, and they were vetted, re realized there is a Rich Dad, and they were happy, and the show on Oprah went on, and the rest is history. So all you guys out there who said, well, there really wasn't a rich dad, and you, well, you believe those idiots out there, this is your show because you're going to find out there really is or was a rich dad. And today we'll be talking to Mike. Who, that was his name in the book, but his real name is Alan. We had to change all of his names and all that. So today is a very special program on the near the 20th anniversary of Rich Dad. So welcome to the program, Al. Welcome, Al. Thank you, Rich Dad Ohana. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Robert for inviting me to come on and share some of our history together. And lessons. And lessons. And what I'd like to do is uh, two things. Um, uh, honor my dad, who's passed away for six years now, and who was always very anonymous in his appearance, in his persona, in his knowledge, unless it dealt with people that could help our family. Because he's a traditional Hawaiian where when there is 
publicity, what comes with it is jealousy. Mm. So he had always told me, Al, you stay low key, you just do what you do, and the good will come out later on. So when I when I so when I wrote Rich Dad Poor Dad, I had to get your agreement, right? That your name yes. was not going to be used. I had to change your name. Yes, yes, yeah. And oh, it uh, no one said anything until it became successful. <laughs> then I think a hundred people claimed to be Rich Dad. <laughs> That's right. They came out of the woodwork, didn't they? Everybody was guessing. Yeah. So, so I asked my dad. I said, Hey, you know, uh, where are you at? And he says, Nope. He said, When I'm gone, it's fine. But while I'm alive, no, I think there is. There's an honor to being anonymous. Yes, right. yes, and you and you took over the family business, Al, right? Yes, yes, so I you, have. So you're the, the other the other thing I wanted what to uh, share with uh, the audience was that when Robert and I were going to school uh, <laughs> in uh, grade school, meaning eighth, ninth, tenth, all the way to senior, um, I was a skinny, sickly kid. Robert was a large Japanese. American who played on the football team and nobody messed around with Robert. So somehow Robert and I, because alphabetically in the public school system, we sat next to each other uh, by K last names. Um, we were always together. So when people picked on me, Robert, as a dear friend many, many years ago, would take them outside and Beat the shit. <laughs> <laughs> you so gotta have a friend he, like that. <laughs> so he became my protector, and I've always yeah. remembered that, Robert, uh, and I've never shared that with you until now. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, thank you, That's thank great. you, thank you. Once again, we're talking. It's a very special radio program. You know, the question is was there a rich dad, or is there a rich dad, or was I lying and all this? Very special program is because Rich Dad's son, my best friend when we're going through school, is today's guest. And we're just being respectful of his dad's wishes that they stay anonymous. And now for the first time, we're just really talking about it. What we want to do today is really talk about some of the lessons about, you know, for all of you want to be entrepreneurs. I mean, you know, my poor dad was an employee and he had an employee mindset, go to school and get a job. Whereas your dad had a very different point of view. And, you know, one of the most important lessons I learned from your dad was when this guy, Bobby, wanted to unionize your company. Remember that? Yes, in Hilo. That's right. And and I yes. still remember you got, You called me up and said, we've got to stand by because if they if the employees going on, go on strike, we've got to shut down the company, right? Yes, yes. So, what, so tell, tell that story if you could. Well, in, in a plantation town like Hilo, where Robert and I are from, uh, it was important that everything be unionized. So... The tourist industry was just being born, and they went after the hotels, they went after the bus drivers, and, and needed to build membership. So they came to our hotel and was able to get a petition to start an election, and their ringleader was the manager. His name was Bobby. Manager so, of your hotel? Yes, he was the manager, but he was, uh, I guess, the most unhappy. So. Oh. They went, we went through the election, which took maybe a year and a half because it was so complicated because my dad would not hire attorneys because he didn't have the money. So his deal was walk around with a baseball bat, <laughs> a baseball bat because, you know, the, the, the union guys would come around and they would threaten us at our home. And cause, because my dad was pretty slight in build, his, his mind and his baseball bat was his power. So after the election was held for the third time in our favor, then the union gave up, and it was like a you know 20 to 19 kind of a vote. So at that time, the the manager Bobby came to my dad and said, "Well, the old timers call my dad Fada, just so you know, F A D A. That was a pigeon way of saying father. So they said, Fada, I'm hereby giving you my resignation because I." I made a bad mistake, and you're a good person. And so my I, dad, so father said, Basil, you're the, next to me, you're the smartest guy at this hotel. So guess what? You, you're not only the manager, you're the general manager, and I'm giving you a raise. <laughs> <laughs> and that lesson, that yeah. lesson to me was like priceless. So your dad saw, your dad saw Bobby, he saw his skills and his talents and his leadership and all of that. 
come out yeah. of this whole incident. And yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. And on the other side of the story was my dad, the poor dad, and he was head of the teachers' union. So, you know, it was a really, really great education, you know, watching Al's dad, you know, handle the union. He was very anti-union. And my dad, who was head of the teachers' union. And so that's how you learn is because you see both points of view, and they both have different points of view, which are valid. So all you doubters and sinners out there, eat lunch. So anyway, today we have a very special program. We have Rich Dad Son. For those who may not be familiar with the story, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is a story of our two dads. My real dad was head of education for the state of Hawaii, and Al's father was Rich Dad. And he started teaching us at around well, – around age nine to be entrepreneurs. And, and Rich Dad dropped out of school at, what, 13 or so? Yeah. I mean, he, he dropped out of school early. But he, ran, yes. he had to run the family business and right. all this. The point here is this, is the difference between an employee and an entrepreneur. And so for Al and I, and we called him Mike in the book, but we had to keep the family name out of the, out of the book for the, you know, out of respect for Rich Dad's wishes. But today, for the first time, it's a very special program Mike or Al is on the program to tell you some stories, we, we, how we grew up. We surf most of the time. I don't know how we got anything done. We're flunking out of school. I don't know how we graduated from college. But somehow I think having Rich Dad's education or Al's dad's education was probably more beneficial to me personally than going to school. And as you know, Rich Dad really never paid us. You know, he says you're getting something much more valuable, which is an education. You know, you actually learn by doing. So he kicked our butts a lot because we were, he called us lazy kids. But, uh, Al, you want to tell the story of having us pick up cigarette butts? Gladly. I enjoyed bringing my C report card to my parents <laughs> because, yeah. You braggered. <laughs> And when it was a D or an F, in those days it was a pencil, so you could make some adjustments. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened was uh, one Saturday it was raining or something, and my dad worked seven days a week. So he said, Al, he said, come down to the hotel. He said, and bring that lazy guy here with you. <laughs> I said, okay. So Robert and I both go down to the hotel. And dad says, okay, you two bums. He said, here's... That's how he talked to us, too. <laughs> and I, now I realize, Robert, he was just trying to save money. He, was, he, he didn't have the money to hire a gardener. <laughs> so, so he gave each of us an empty can of Folgers, uh, a container, Golf. and said, okay, Robert, you're going to take this wing, and Al, you're going to take the other wing. And what, your job is to fill the can with cigarette butts with uh, cigarette butts or cigar butts, and when you're done, you bring it back, and I'll give you a quarter, or I'll give you a cheeseburger, whichever you want. So I thought it was since, five bucks he was going to give us. Oh no, that's when we were doing heavy labor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we settled for one dollar, Robert, because yeah. we were desperate. But when when the first day it was easy, we were done like in 15 minutes. So we brought the Folgers can back, all proud. We collected our. 25 cents. We're all happy. We said, ah, we got them. So the next day, Dad says, okay, be back here at 8 o'clock. You know, bring Robert with you, and we're going to continue. Folger, do the same thing. Well, that went on every weekend for about six weekends. And then the hotel was clean because we had picked up all the cigarette butts. <laughs> and there was, there, there was no fresh source of, of junk. So <laughs> what... what uh, Robert and I, we looked at each other and we said, you know, we're screwed. This is getting harder and harder. And this is BS. 25 cents for four hours of work and we just can't find uh, cigarette butts. <laughs> so, so he and I says, you know, I think, I think what we got to do is let's, let's outthink uh, Fada. Let's find out where he's throwing all these cigarette butts. And I said, well, what are, what are we going to do with that? He said, we're going to fill our cans. <laughs> so so, so then because, we're, because we're young and we're stupid, but we, we had guts, the, the next day we, we, filled, we got the cans. He gave us the cans. And 15 minutes later, we're back. Really not too smart. So, so Pop says, okay, you guys did your work? He says, yep. So Dad went to the back of his office where he had his pile, and he looked at it, and he says, Keo, he called 
Robert Keel. He says, Keel, Al, he said, you don't have to do this anymore. What do you mean? Are we getting fired? He says, no, you folks have potential to be businessmen. (laughs) (laughs) And we continued on, we continued on. That's right. Hey, I I got a question, Al. Um, You know, we hear all the lessons that Robert learned from your dad, what, and I and I I've met your dad and I've met Robert's dad. Do, did you have lessons that you learned from Robert's dad? Yeah, um, Doctor Ralph was very straight arrow, very strict, very re, very respectful to Robert's mother, and they were they were a family unit that I didn't have because my parents got divorced early. Hmm. So I loved hanging around. Uh, the Kiyosaki house, plus the food was good. <laughs> Mrs. K was a wonderful cook. <laughs> so, so, but but he was uh, he, he he was a tough educator yeah. and subsequently a bureaucrat. I guess and that, and seeing that endearingly. Yeah. Once again, it's the Rich Dad Radio Show. We're talking today. It's a very special program. We're talking to Mike, who was Rich Dad's son, but his real name was Alan. Again, we had to change the names out of respect to his dad. But I learned more from, you know, having both dads and, you know, things like teaching us how to think creatively, think outside the box. You know, like we went and st- <laughs> we went and stole back the cigarette butts we had picked up earlier because it was getting hard to make a living uh, cigarette <laughs> butts. <laughs> but the other thing that happened, which was pretty interesting, was when my dad and Al's dad collided, was that Al's dad had, a, let's say, a little village of uh, rental properties and I think it was in 1960 this tidal wave came through. So Al and yeah. I would have been about 13 years old. Yeah. And the tidal wave cleaned out Alan's dad's rental property because they're all on one property. And then the battle started between my dad and Al's dad because my dad was now head of the Hawaii Redevelopment Association, whatever they were. And my dad condemned Alan's dad's land. So basically my dad was going to take Alan's dad's land. And so I'd go home and I would hear, I would just catch hell from my dad saying, well, that SOB, you know, he wants too much money for it. And da, 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 da. And I'd go back and I'd listen to Al's dad talking about, you know, your father's going to condemn my land. So it's really the classic battle between capitalist and socialist. But what what did what happened though? What happened with, wasn't there a deal made about the land and that yeah, were rich that dad? Was, what, what was well, that, Al? What I, what I learned was that just observing my dad when I wasn't working for him, I was just a kid, was that he fed on opportunity going counter to the herds. So if there was a tidal wave coming at you, everyone would be running one way, he would jump into it. <laughs> so when the tsunami in Hilo happened and it devastated downtown Hilo, Robert's father was correct in saying there cannot be redevelopment anymore because there's a tidal wave here every 10 years. And my dad, with his street sense, said, well, I'm going to be shut down here, but if I can get government help to rebuild, then maybe I'll go build a hotel. So the federal government came in, and they were able to fund the redevelopment of what then became the original hotel in Hilo that Robert and I picked up cigarette butts at. (laughs) Well, if Robert's father had said, hey, you can rebuild, I think we'd still have a village with rental properties, and that would have been it. So the tidal wave made your dad richer. Yeah, it was the opportunity, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that was the th- that's the way it went. There were several tidal waves. We're going to tell that story later on. But this is the lesson I learned from actually both dads. Is my you know my dad was a good guy. He condemned all the land, but Al's dad always saw the opportunity in tragedy. Or you know no matter what happened, yeah. there was always an opportunity. So that that was in 1960, and then not too long later, another giant. Hurricane it was a hurricane this time hit Hawaii. Hurricane Aniki. Hurricane Aniki. Oh yeah, yeah this, this is, Okay, and, Al, this is one of my favorite stories. And by this time, Al's dad had a whole empire going of hotels because, as most entrepreneurs do, they use their funds to to expand their business. So he, now he had hotels on all the islands from one disaster. 
So then this t- this next hurricane hits the island of Kauai and cleans out your dad's hotel there, right? Just destroys yeah. it. But what yeah. did he do? At, what did he do before the hurricane came? Well, before he did the hurricane, because my dad did not fly because he was afraid of flying. So um, he lived on the phone, and he was a tremendous delegator of making sure that he was involved in every aspect of the operation, but hired smarter people than him. That was so the key to success. success, to success. Yeah. Yes. He, had some, he had a smart team around him, and they were yeah. sharp. But, but when uh, Hurricane Iniki came a couple of days prior, he said, okay, Al, what you're going to do is you're going to go to the bank and you're going to pull out, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash. Wow. He said, and you're going to put them all in bundles and get ready, uh, fly to Hilo, buy building materials, which is on the southernmost island from Kauai. But conventional people were not thinking of, okay, if something happens, number one, we've got to wait for the insurance guy which we didn't have to because we had cash. Secondly, we got to get building supplies on the island. Forget it. They, they made the prices triple. But back in Hilo, there was no threat of a hurricane, so there was oh, materials ready. Smart. And there were Hilo laborers that were hungry for work. <laughs> so he, so he, he had this all planned ahead of time in case this happens. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So when it hit, you, you sent your younger brother over there or something, right? To- yes. Well, I also like how that how your how your relative got onto a helicopter, a media press well, helicopter. Well, well, that was, <laughs> he had to get there, was, right? Nobody could get was, to the island. That was me and my kid brother, who is a musician but is now a pastor. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> he, he convinced the the ABC News plane to take us as humanitarian workers. <laughs> so we jumped on board. We got to Lihue Airport. We ran from the plane because the National Guard knew we were not supposed to be know, used people. Yeah, and we just ran and looked for vans where tourists had just abandoned on the street and looked for you know full tanks of gas. And that's how both Donnie and I were able to each get a van and maneuver our way back to our Kauai Sands Hotel. <laughs> and then didn't you guys take, you, you pay some National Guard guy who had a bulldozer to bulldoze the wreckage in, of your hotel into the ocean anyway? Yes, that, that was once we realized by... It was a total loss by anyway. blessing, yeah, that the National Guard team that guarded Kapa'a, where Kauai Sands was, uh, was from the Big Island. <laughs> so the Big Island people were... Sticking were, together. Yeah, they're sticking together, Robert. But here's here's what I love is it's like whatever it takes. I mean, talk about street smart. You know, your dad options all the supplies. You guys figure out how to get to the island when nobody can get there. It's I mean, it's off limits to everybody. Figure out how to get to the hotel, and then you see the hotel is a mess. And then and then what did you do? When the- well, the the first thing um, Dad did was okay. We've got to get twenty rooms built. Twenty rooms built, no matter what it takes, because we're gonna ship in. 40 Hilo construction guys, and we're going to pay them cash out of Hilo and leave them a little bit of allowance, have their wives or their girlfriends come pick up the money every Friday and give them allowance because they're only going to drink and gamble it away anyway in Kauai. <laughs> but that's how we're able to get up and running in seven months while everybody, even Coco Palms today, it's is still, still closed. Unbuilt. Yeah. They're still waiting for insurance. They were waiting for insurance. Yeah, so right? while, yeah. while everybody was in court waiting for insurance money, Al's uh, dad already had his hotel up and running. It was the most profitable time ever because you were the only guys with hotel rooms, right? Exactly, yeah. So once again, it's Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. It's a very special program. We're talking to Mike from the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad is Rich Dad's Son. His real name is Alan, and we're talking about what does it take to be an entrepreneur, how to be creative, think outside the box, and why he is a very rich man. We'll be right back. The Rich Dad Radio Show with Robert Kiyosaki. The good news and bad news about money. Learn about money and investing while having fun. Go to richdad.com to play the cash flow classic game online. Your banker will never ask for your report card. What's most important in entrepreneurship and investing is your financial statement. So go to richdad.com and play cash flow classic to learn anytime, anywhere. Start playing today and take your first steps out of the rat race. Meet and interact with players who have the same goals and aspirations. Best of all, it's free. Go to richdad.com and start changing your life today by playing Cashflow Classic at richdad.com.
This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. Today we have a very, very special program. You know, for all you doubters out there who said there's no Rich Dad, or you believe those people who say there's no Rich Dad, this is the program. We have Rich Dad's son on board in the book. He was called Mike. And we had to do that to protect the family and the name and all this because the family is very private like many rich families are. They're very private. They don't want to know anybody that's rich because and they have new friends all the time. <laughs> so um, today we're telling stories about rich dad. And it's especially good for those of you who want to be entrepreneurs because most people come out of school. They're more like my poor dad. You know, I think everything happens in a straight line. But as Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. And unfortunately, my poor dad had knowledge. He had no imagination. And if you've been listening to this program, you can listen to it again because we archive our programs at richdadradio.com. You can listen to how my rich dad thought. He thought outside the box. He had a great imagination, which drove my poor dad nuts because he was not playing by the rules. Well, he never played by the rules. That's why he was rich. And there's so many stories we could tell, but we best not tell them. So anyway, Kim met him once, right? What was that? I did. Like? I did meet him once, and uh, just as just as Al is saying, very very unpretentious. I mean, when I met him, Al he had this very small office. His couch basically went wall to wall, and it was pretty beat up. And he had a dirty white T-shirt, and he was chomping on a cigar and. Um, he was pretty gruff. He was pretty he had pretty rubber blunt, slippers on. Pretty and blunt. I, I think we were in there for all of maybe four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but let me set this whole thing up. Is the reason the reason I, t- I let Kim start was that I made the when I was trying the nylon and velcro surfer wallet business. First of all, he was always Rich. was always available if I wanted to talk to him. Except I never liked what he t- what he told me. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's stupid. I told you you can't think. You slap me around so. One day I made the ultimate mistake as I drove up to him and the wallet company was doing well, you know, and all this, but we needed money to expand. So myself and uh, John Rowe and Larry Clark, we, we, we dressed like the disco ducks. We drove up there in his 450 SL Mercedes, you know, and we went up to Rich Dad and I opened the door and I sat down with him and I asked for $100,000 and... and uh, you know, the, the reason the room was only the size of a couch is because square footage in Waikiki is expensive. So he just looked at Al and says, close the door. And you two clowns get out of here. So it was Larry and John Rowe. They had, he kicked them out. Then I sat down. And what happened after that, Al? <laughs> oh, no. Um, Dad, Dad just reamed you. <laughs> He, what did he, he say? He, he, he was screaming said, so loud uh, the, the secretary stopped working. Yeah. Yeah, he, he had just said, you know, what the hell are you doing? No, it what wasn't hell. Clowns? It was F word, F word, yeah. F word. Yeah, and and you're showing showing me all these papers. He said, I understand these papers, meaning the financials, but you don't, Robert. Can you tell me what this means? Can you tell me cash flow, balance sheet, assets, liabilities? Uh, and you stumbled. And he said, you're as dumb as those two other clowns here. <laughs> Don't waste my time. <laughs> well, he also said, don't come back yeah. until you never until... need my money. Yes. And he, he told me the story. You know, he says, you're like a camel. You know, you, you're going halfway across the desert. You're going to run out of money. And then you come back to me again because you don't know how to make money. Yeah. Yep. And he was screaming. And so Al... You, know, you told the story, you were standing at the door trying to keep the vibrations down so the secretaries wouldn't hear it, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, that, but, then, but then when we came, when I Don't met him, come back until you don't need money, until you never yes. need my money again. And so when we did come back, when I met him for the first time. This I was mean, years later. Years and years later, we were doing well. And he looked at you, Robert, and he said, so I don't know the exact words, but you, you understand. You got it. And it was like, mm. okay, now get out of here. <laughs> get the but f, is. get the f so, out of here. Yeah. So I mean, it really did come full circle. Yeah. Yeah. But it yeah. took me a while to learn the lesson. And hang on, today, Al, this is the lesson for all of you. Is I listen to people pitch me deals all the time, and I feel like you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I said, you stupid. Blah, blah. And these people are just like you say, dreamers. You know, what I mean, they don't, they don't have any experience. And they think me giving them money will solve their problem. I mean, you must see that all the time too, right? 
Yeah, yeah, it's not instant happy. Most people want money so they can live. They're not going to build a business. No, they're just going to burn it. Yeah, and, and that's, that's what he—that's what Rich Dad was afraid that you were going to do. <laughs> and he was right because I went—I went bust right. I mean, we we're very successful. The wallet business took off exactly as I said it would. The trouble is, we couldn't keep, we couldn't sustain. In other words, this is what I say to most people: success is expensive. So we took off, but then we couldn't refinance the next. We couldn't reinvest. We couldn't reinvest. We couldn't reinvest. So we started borrowing and borrowing, borrowing, just so, so we could buy more inventory to yeah. feed the machine. And we couldn't, we couldn't sustain, and we went down. Right out. Just got sucked into the, the the whirlpool. Yeah. Yeah. Success is expensive. And, I've, and so one of the lessons when I talk to people on be entrepreneurs is, you know, how can you afford to keep reinvesting to grow your company? And that's why the story of your dad, you know, and my dad fighting about the first tidal wave that wiped him out is that that was his seed money to grow his business, right? Yes, yes. Well, but, uh, you know, uh, on the other hand, Robert, you, you had one poor dad, and my dad was the original rich dad, but you've since had other rich dads that have guided you and Kim until today. Yes. So that in itself is a blessing that it, st- it started something, but the opportunity is still there. My. Right. Well, More I, than think, ever now. I think the greatest gift of all was that your dad, <laughs> your dad, he says his greatest dream was to teach others to be entrepreneurs. You know, he wanted to take yeah. young guys under his uh, under his wing and teach them to be entrepreneurs. Yeah. I remember asking him one day, I said, well, what about me? He says, you're too effing stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but now look, but now look, now look, as a result of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, your dad is doing that. I mean, unbelievable through through the success of the book. And let me ask you, Al, did your dad ever talk about Rich Dad, Poor Dad or Robert and Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Was he surprised at the success of the book? Did you ever have that discussion? He was thrilled. And he was honored that he played a part in it. But other than that, my dad wasn't one to to blow smoke or to hug or to praise. The results were in 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 your your global brand, Robert Kim. Yeah, yeah. I do remember you telling me Al about um, losing a few employees because they had read Rich Dad Poor Dad. Yeah, and you you lost one because they had read this book and they were going to go out on their own, and, and then you and, lost and, a. And they didn't know that you were the guy in the no, book. No, they didn't know. Yeah. Your employees and, yeah. did not know. And no. and then another manager said, "Oh, I just read this book and I'm going to do my own thing." And there was like three or four employees that left, and you told your dad, and he said something like, ah, "Kiyosaki, <laughs> it's killing me." <laughs> tell, tell him enough already. Enough, <laughs> enough already. <laughs> Uh, love it. Yep, and they never knew it was you. So anyway, you know, I thank you for being a great friend for all these years and being also. support and being supportive and you know, in memory of both our dads. Yeah, how's that for an honor? Yeah, the work goes on because both were great men. Both were great teachers, and they're both SOBs. <laughs> that <laughs> it was. It's a. It's been a great, great ride. And uh, you know, I thank you and your dad and your family for making a contribution to the world. Oh, and also thank you for for teaching the world and continuing your education. And you're, you're not stopping, which is wonderful. No, and we're just getting started, really. Good, good. So thank you, Al. Th- thanks for uh, being willing to share your story. My pleasure. So okay, let's wrap this up, the lessons I learned from Rich Dad. For me, the biggest thing was that he wasn't rich when we met him, when, when Al and I were kids. But what happened over the years, I saw him get smarter and smarter and smarter because he was always outside the box. He, you know, to, to be successful as an entrepreneur, there's no one right answer. So if I could leave you with that, he had multiple answers. He failed more times than he succeeded. But as the years went on, you know, by the time I was in my 30s, not only was he much smarter, but he was a lot richer. On the other side of it, my poor dad, my real dad, got poorer and poorer and poorer simply because he wasn't learning anything new. He, he didn't make any mistakes until he ran for lieutenant governor of the state of Hawaii as a Republican. When he lost that election, he lost his job. My mother died. Uh, his uncle died. And he was unemployed. And my dad, who had never made mistakes, my poor dad, 
suddenly was faced with this huge disaster. He didn't have the skills to succeed as an entrepreneur. He tried, but he didn't have it. And that's why I'm so adamant about, you know, people going to school. They're always saying, don't make mistakes. You know, do as you're told. And that's why Rich Dad was so successful. He didn't follow those ideas. And so for Kim and I today, you know, we've made many mistakes. We've done a lot of things that are unorthodox and all this, but that's why we're successful. Because when you try something you've never done before, even if you fail at it, you get smarter. So if I could leave you with that idea. So I'm always doing things. Kim knows I do something not because I need to do it, but I do it because I need to make a mistake. If I, when I make a mistake and do something stupid, then I have to figure out how I'm going to get out of that mess, right? Yeah, and you know, one thing I heard Al say is that Rich Dad always surrounded himself with people smarter than himself. Right. And I think that was one of the the the, the problems of your poor dad is because he was the academic, because he had to be the smartest one, he didn't surround himself with smart people. He thought he always had to have the answer, and I, I think that's why he didn't make it as an entrepreneur. And today, in this you know, this economic turmoil, the people that are really getting screwed and fall, falling behind are the guys who were really smart 10 years ago. Hmm. And I meet so many guys, well, you know, I'm, a, I, I'm, a, I'm an accountant, you know, I'm an attorney and all this, but the world has changed, and they can't change with it. So when I meet people who were, you know, smart people five years ago, they're obsolete today. So if I could leave you with that's the reason I want to tell you some of the stories. I wish I could tell you all of them because some of the things that Rich Dad did were uh, best not said. You know what I mean? They weren't illegally immoral and all that, but he was so outside the box because he had no money. See, one of the biggest problems in school is there's only one right answer. And it's the answer that the teacher has been told to give you as the answer. In real life, to be a successful entrepreneur, and especially if you have no money, you've got to be extremely creative. And that's why Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge. My poor dad had knowledge, and my rich dad had imagination. And I wish I could tell you all the stories, but I think they'd be inappropriate, should we say that. So we're coming in to ask Robert, because the whole theme of this show is this. Even if you're not born rich, you still have it in you. You know, you can still make it. And not having money is not an excuse. As Al talked about it, every time something happened, he, Rich Dad saw it as an opportunity. The other thing he had was he, as he grew older, he had a better team of people around him. So he could make better decisions. And as he got older, towards the end of his life as an entrepreneur, he was brilliant. But he was still taking risks, doing things that people say you shouldn't do. Comments, Kim? Well, what I what I love, you know, Rich Dad was not politically correct by any means, and I think that helped him quite a bit. But you know, I love listening to the stories, and, and going back to the story we told about Hurricane and Nikki, um, I love that. It's like whatever you have to do, you do it. He's great. Rich Dad was great at solving problems, and two things about that story is when when Alan and his and his um, cousin got there, they saw the hotel and it was like a mess. And Rich hotel Dad, was destroyed. There was nothing left of it. Instead of waiting to ask permission, so, yeah. Instead of waiting to ask permission, they found a, a they found the guy with a bulldozer because all of the military was there with bulldozers. And, and, and Rich Dad goes, "Just have him give him two hundred dollars and push it into the ocean," and that's how they cleared yeah. the land. I mean, there's story after story after story of whatever it takes, and he's a great example of that. So while people were waiting for the trucks and things to come over from Oahu, wherever they were. You know, to start the, the you know the clearing of the thing and hauling the rubbish away, their land was already clear. They were building. He was already putting ads in the local tourist magazines for the reopening of his hotel, and the ad, sales ads people are like crazy, thinking he's nuts because there's no way you're going to get your hotel open that soon. And he goes, "You watch me." And so as, he already was up and running. And as Alan said, they're up and running in seven months. Then that was the most profitable time of their entire career because they're the only guys with 20 rooms available and everybody had to go there. And they just kept raising the rates because it was supply and demand. And to this, I think that that the hurricane hit in the 80s. And to this day, there are still hotels that are shut down on Ka- island of Kauai because they're still waiting for insurance money to do it. And so that's really what's happening. The whole point here is this. You don't get smart waiting to be told what to do. And that's how, and we had no money. You're going to hear some final words about what happens when you're willing to learn from a man like Rich Dad 
versus a man like my poor dad who was just doing as he was told. And so once again, this is the Ask Robert section. You can submit your questions to Ask Robert at richdadradio.com. So what's the first question, Melissa? Our first question today comes from John in Los Angeles. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It says, Robert, do you ever wonder what your life would be like if you never met your rich dad? All the time. All the time. As, and that's why this program is so important is because if I had listened to only my poor dad today, I'd probably be an airline pilot or I'd be a, a guy driving oil tankers with Standard Oil. I'd be a good employee, probably making a half million a year. But what the most important thing about my rich dad, he taught me how to be a free human being. And you start by being free, by being free with your thoughts, that you can think freely without worrying of criticism and condemnation and legalities and all this. That's the most important thing. I just don't understand people saying to their kids, you've got to go to school and get a job. I mean, you're actually crushing the kid's brain and imagination. Any comments, Ken? Well, I, you told me a story, Robert, because, you know, all these stories are all about entrepreneurship, even though I don't know if you realized that at the time as a kid. But you also told me a story, and it, and it went along with the cigarette butt story, <laughs> picking up the cigarette butts. And, and uh, Al, Alan was nice about that story. <laughs> but, uh, Rich Dad was an SOB. You know? But didn't, didn't Rich Dad, like, he owed you a bunch of money? Yeah, yeah. That, but he kept tricking us because we kept tricking him. And what he did finally was he said, okay, you can pick up this and I'll give you five bucks. But you have to really, because it was hard. You know, Alan said there was no cigarette butts out there, so it was kind of hard. And when people said no opportunities, well, we have to go find more cigarette butts, but we couldn't cheat now. So we finally got the, the can, one, it's a gallon, you know, fruit can of, coffee can of cigarette butts. He says, okay, I'll give you five bucks. And he said, you got to pay us. He says, I'll pay you next week. And I went, you got to pay us. He says, okay, you guys do it again. I'll give you five bucks again. I'll owe you five, I'll pay another five. So we went out, we did the same thing. And finally I started crying and screaming at him. He said, you SOB, why, why are you cheating two little kids? You don't know this. He says, I want to teach you a lesson. I said, what's that? He says, you guys, as long as you need money. Oh, no, what he did was that he finally discounted us down to a dollar a can. So from $5, it went to a dollar a can. And we're screaming and spitting and crying. Did, didn't he? Didn't he say, "I'll give you the, I'll give you the, I'll give you the five dollars like in two weeks, or you can have a dollar now." Yeah, something today, like something that. Like he that. was yeah. always screwing yeah. around with us, <laughs> you know, messing with our brains, you know. And finally, we took the dollar because we we're so desperate. We've been we'd gone like a month without any money. He, he paid us occasionally, but most of the time he didn't pay us, like twenty five cents here and free hamburgers, but. At the final, we took the money, and he was laughing. He was just laughing his ass off. I said, why are you laughing? He says, it's the most valuable lesson you can have. I said, what's that? He says, if you need money, you'll always work for less. Good lesson. And I never forgot that lesson. So even when I had no money, nobody knew I had no money. When I was pitching deals and I had nothing, no money behind me, nobody knew I had no money when I was pitching a deal. I always pretend that like I had the financing in place. And that's the lessons. Okay. He was a tough teacher. Next question, Melissa. Next question comes from Ellen in Bozeman, Montana. Favorite book, Unfair Advantage. Robert, do you consider yourself a natural entrepreneur? Even if you didn't have a rich dad, would you have made your way into entrepreneurship? That's a great question. The answer is no. But I don't know if anybody's a natural. I mean, I know guys who are good at good entrepreneurs, but everybody is an entrepreneur. You see, in my neighborhood, there's little little, little kids yep. in my neighborhood. Yeah. They get out every Saturday, and they have a little lemonade stand, and they're selling you know, lemonade to joggers and hikers in our neighborhood. They're entrepreneurs. The thing is, can you be a rich and successful entrepreneur? That's the difference. There's many entrepreneurs. Most of them are broke. But what the reason why I'm on this show with Al is how you think is can you think outside the box? Can you do things other people will not do? But without Rich Dad, I would never become an entrepreneur because as my, you know, because I failed so many times. I just kept failing and Rich Dad kept encouraging me to fail. You know, when I lost my first nylon and Velcro surfer ball business, my poor dad was upset, but my Rich Dad said, congratulations. He says, most entrepreneurs lose three or four businesses. Henry Ford went bankrupt five times before starting Ford Motor Company. But in the school system, if you make one mistake, you're stupid. So that's why we play, you know, tell the teacher we're surfing, because by all means, I mean, Al and I flunked out twice 
in high school. We couldn't write. We couldn't read in English. But it didn't stop us from becoming rich. I, I would, and I question whether you say you would not be an entrepreneur because, number one, I don't know if anybody would ever hire you. That's, first that's kind thing. Of, well, that's, that's another you story. Do have so. a, you do have an issue with authority, and I mean, I hate being told what to do, and I can't see you sitting still. So I, I, that's a good question. It's a good one to ponder because you were, you were chasing gold when you were in Vietnam, and you were, do, you were shipping yeah, but, back tables. And, but I was already being encouraged to be an entrepreneur. From early on. From early on. That's a good point. Not punished. Next question. Our next question comes from Clark in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. What advice do you have for getting along with family members who are not aligned with you financially? That's a tough question, and I would just say leave dead dogs alone. No, leave sleeping dogs or dead dogs. I don't know if they're sleeping or dead. Sleeping dogs lie. Yeah, leave them alone. You see that? (laughs) Whatever. No, although everybody can be an entrepreneur, most people should not be because it is so hard for me. You know, to I always say start small, make sure you can do one thing a little at a time, and all this get better at it. But most people don't have the patience; they want to get rich quick, right? Yeah, most and most people don't have the. They just they think the They're same old way. They're doing it the same old way. It's what you say, Robert. You know, go to school, get a job, save money, live below your means, all of that. Um, and do I mean, I, told. I I got family members. That's their point of view. That's how they live. And so I don't talk finances to them they can i've given them the books i've told them our point of view and it, it comes a point where you know let them let them go <laughs> i, them I go. have family members that come up to me and they show me their kids report cards and they're all straight a's and i said they're screwed and you know like family members look at me like i'm nuts I said, why the kids are straight a's too and how can they be screwed it's because they can't think you know i mean they may be very smart academically yeah. but they're not going to be smart financially or in the real world as I say to a lot of people, you know, the kid does very well in school, but when you shift environments, you know, education, the classroom is one environment, but you shift to another environment like the football field or surfing, I'll kick the kid's ass. You know what I mean? So environments are everything, and most kids who are A students get do well inside a classroom, but can they do well on the streets? And that's where Rich Dad was extremely successful. I'll say this again. He had nothing. He had no education. He had no money. But that made him smarter and better. And towards the end of his life, he had an empire. Most people who are just doing what they're told may not have that. Next question, Melissa. Our last question today comes from Todd in Pittsburgh. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It says, what would you say is the number one lesson you learned from both your rich dad and your poor dad? It's to be actually, be, this may sound strange, but to be honest and have integrity. But that this is the difference, you see, what most people don't realize, the rules for an entrepreneur are opposite for rules of an employee. Just look at the tax rules. Employees pay a certain level of tax. Entrepreneurs pay no tax. So the whole thing is not only mindset different and the skill sets are different, but the rules are different. So a lot of times what my rich dad was doing my poor dad said he was a crook. And when and when I became successful in the, in Honolulu with my nylon Velcro wallet business, and the teacher ran, I mean, the newspaper ran a story of me calling me an entrepreneur. This is in the 70s. My poor dad called me up and says, that's terrible. I said, what's wrong with being called an entrepreneur? He says, it means you're a crook. And that is the point of view of many socialists today. They see Donald Trump as a crook. They see rich people as crooks. But these guys are the academians, you know what I mean? The guys who know all the answers, but they can't do jack. All they have is a, all they have is a paycheck, and they invest in the stock market. So you're going to be an entrepreneur in business. You've got to be an entrepreneur. You're going to do real estate. You've got to be an entrepreneur. But the rules are different. Points of view are different. Our skill sets are different. 